The following program contains subject matter that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Many of us know the thrill of dressing up for Halloween. It's the one night of the year where it's okay to pretend to be someone you're not and to allow yourself to indulge in dark fantasies. Horror movies are full of killers who wear masks in order to scare their victims. The masks are scary not just because of what they show, but also because of what they hide. They conceal the killer's true identity and intentions. The masks remove their humanity. But mask killers aren't just the stuff of fantasy in Hollywood movies. History is full of examples of real criminals who disguise their faces, sometimes to commit their crimes, and sometimes to relive them. In 1960, on the small island of Jersey, a small boy wakes up in the middle of the night to see a dark figure standing over the edge of his bed. He can barely make out a man's face in the moonlight, and he's horrified by what he sees. The man appears disfigured, his hair is unkempt, and his eyes are hollow. The man is Edward Paisnell. He's wearing a disguise that consists of an old tattered rubber mask and a woman's wig. Paisnell brutally sexually assaults the boy. The child tries to fight back, but Paisnell is also wearing nail-studded bracelets and shoulder pads that pierce him as he struggles. This scenario repeats itself for 10 years as Paisnell assaults young boys and women by breaking into their homes while dressed as what the locals nickname the Beast of Jersey. He's caught in 1971 when he's stopped by police after he speeds through a roadblock in a stolen car. Police discover the mask on the inner lining of his coat. At his barn, they find a satanic altar where Paisnell would sacrifice animals and perform rituals. He had modeled himself after the notorious child killer, Gilles de Rey, who was thought to have killed up to 200 kids in the 15th century. Paisnell is charged with 13 counts of rape and sodomy and sentenced to 30 years in prison. Although he was never charged of any murder, he has been linked to unsolved missing children's cases as well as the murder of a woman in 1966. At around midnight on February 22nd, 1946, Jimmy Hollis and his girlfriend Mary Jean Larry are parked on a lonely road often frequented by teenagers in search of privacy when a tall man wearing a white mask over his head with holes cut out for his eyes approaches the driver's side of the vehicle. The man points a gun at Hollis and orders the couple to get out of the car. He tells Jimmy Hollis to take off his pants and then strikes him twice in the head with a blunt object, knocking him unconscious. The man asks Mary to give him her purse but she tells him she doesn't have one, at which point he also strikes her and proceeds to sexually assault her. He penetrates her with the barrel of his gun. Mary manages to get up and run away. She eventually reaches a house and is able to contact police. Both Mary and Jimmy survive the attack, but subsequent victims of the Phantom Killer are not so lucky. Over the course of 10 weeks, the Phantom kills five people and wounds three others. The murders send the town of Texarkana into a state of panic, many of the residents even going as far as packing their belongings and moving away. Although suspicion falls on the son of a minister named Yule Sweeney, the killer is never caught and the case remains unsolved. The Texarkana Moonlight Murders, as they came to be called, were the inspiration for the 1976 film The Town That Dreaded Sundown, which in itself inspired many horror movies. Its influence can clearly be seen in Friday the 13th Part 2, in which Jason Voorhees wears a sack over his head reminiscent of the Phantom Killer. On September 27, 1969, Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard are having a picnic at Lake Berryessa in Napa County, California. The young students are lying on the ground along the shoreline when Shepard notices a man lingering in the distance. She turns away and tries to ignore him, but when she turns back to look again, she sees that the man has walked even closer. 
When he gets within around 100 feet of the couple, he steps behind a tree. When he emerges again, he's wearing a bizarre black costume, which consists of a black executioner's hood and a waistline bib decorated with a cross circle symbol. He walks toward the couple pointing a gun, at which point Shepard screams and tells Hartnell to run. By the time they get up, the man is already within shooting range. He tells them that he's an escaped convict who killed a guard and needs money in order to flee to Mexico. In reality, the hooded man is the notorious Zodiac killer who has been terrorizing Northern California with seemingly random killings and taunting police with letters and cryptic ciphers. The Zodiac forces Shepard to tie Hartnell up using plastic clothesline. She does as she's told, and then the killer ties her too. Believing that they are being robbed, Hartnell tries to reason with the Zodiac and asks him if his gun is really loaded. The Zodiac takes out the gun's clip to show Hartnell that it is, and then proceeds to stab the couple. He stabs Hartnell six times and Shepard ten times before fleeing. Using a black marker, the Zodiac leaves behind a message on Hartnell's car door that reads, Vallejo, December 20, 1968, July 4th, 1969, September 27, 1969, 6.30. By knife. He then heads to a phone booth 27 miles away in downtown Napa and calls police. I want to report a murder. No, a double murder. They are two miles north of Park headquarters. They were in a white Volkswagen car in Kia. I'm the one who did it. The couple is still alive by the time that they are ushered away by an ambulance, but Cecilia Shepard dies two days later in the hospital. Interestingly, it seems as though the attack at Lake Berryessa is the only time that the Zodiac wears a costume. The Beast of Jersey, the Phantom Killer, and the Zodiac are examples of criminals who use masks either to hide their identity or to terrify their victims. But masks have also been used by killers for other means. A teenager from Plainfield, Wisconsin is visiting the home of his neighbor, Edward Gein, when he notices what look like human heads on a counter. Gein claims they're shrunken head relics from the South Seas that were sent to him by a cousin who had served in World War II. The teen tells the townspeople about what he saw, but they have a hard time believing his story until two other men visit Gein's house and see the heads for themselves. Still. They dismiss them as Halloween decorations, and no one contacts the authorities. Kids in the neighborhood begin to refer to Gein's home as a haunted house, and sometimes they dare each other to peer into the window to catch a glimpse of the shrunken heads. In actuality, the heads are human facial skins that Gein peels off of female corpses in order to wear as masks as part of a strange cross-dressing ritual. When his house is searched as part of a murder investigation, Authorities even find a shirt made of human skin, complete with human breasts, and Gein would later confess to wearing the shirt around his house and also to draping female genitalia over his naked groin. Police learn he's obsessed with the idea of becoming a woman, in large part due to an unhealthy obsession with his dead mother. Gein is known to have robbed nine graves and committed two murders. He is part of the inspiration for the character of Norman Bates in Psycho and Leatherface in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Forty-year-old Dennis Rader is spending time in his parents' basement taking photos. He's a father of two, a Cub Scout leader, and the president of the local church congregation. To most people in his neighborhood, he seems like an upstanding citizen. But Rader is also a deeply sadistic killer, known to police as BTK. By 1985, he has already killed eight people, most of them by suffocation or strangulation. While alone in his parents' basement, He relives his murders by posing for photos while dressed up in his victim's clothing and wearing a plastic mask of a woman's face. (sighs) 
Most of his killings involve brutal acts of bondage, and it seems like the photographs are an attempt to recreate the sexual arousal he felt while committing them. Sometimes he travels to motels for the photo shoots, other times he does them out in the woods. He kills two more people and continually mocks police until he's finally caught in 2005 and sentenced to life in prison. Although all these killers use masks for different reasons, they terrify us because they call to mind our fear of anonymous death, or they remind us that our identities are fragile. You may think you know your neighbors, but the masks we all wear can be deceiving. Now I want to know what you think. Who was the scariest mass killer and why? As always, if you like this video, please subscribe to Cryptic for more.